Jeg håber, at I, I kan høre os, eller i hvert fald høre mig, som er Mikkel fra 32G i Danmark. I første omgang vil jeg gerne sige rigtig hjertelig velkommen og rigtig god aften til jer alle sammen. Og velkommen til vores webinar om god energi og ernæring, specielt op mod et halvmarathon. Vi er super duper glade for, at I vil være med til forhåbentlig god aften i selskab med 32G og en masse andre glade løbere. Jeg håber, at I har fået puttet jeres børn, har fået spist og fået trænet, og så kan læne jer tilbage i et godt selskab. Tanken var faktisk, at vi ville i samarbejde med løberen og BT Halvmarathon give alle jer deltagere her god inspiration til energi og ernæring op til lige præcis et halvmarathon som jo mest af skyldes, at der jo er BT i halvmarathonen her på næste søndag den 26. Og der er det jo en god idé at være velforberedt. Webinaret i aften, det hostes af 32G's grundlægger Mark Wolf, som er grundlægger og elite ernæringscoach gennem 20 år, og arbejder med nogle af verdens bedste, både triatleter, løber og cykelhold. Og øh, I skal vide, at Mark har rigtig meget på hjerte som regel, og øh, selvom at vi har sagt, at det, det skal være en time, så håber jeg, at vi kan holde det på en time. I får mulighed for undervejs at chatte med os, og vi kan så svare undervejs. Det kan I gøre inde i, i den øh, skærm, at I ser på jeres PC eller jeres tablet, eller hvordan I har lukket på. Og øh, vi vil så svare undervejs eller bringe det ind i debatten, afhængig af, hvad det er for spørgsmål, I stiller. Øh, rent teknisk eller praktisk kan man sige, så ser I på PowerPoint og hører Marks stemme. Ja, lige nu er det Mikkels stemme, men Marks stemme kommer på på engelsk. Og, øh, vi har valgt ikke at, at tilslutte video, fordi så vil I både se en mark og en powerpoint. Det vil desværre nok formere mere, end det gavner. Øh, men jeres chat eller jeres spørgsmål kan I sagtens stille på dansk. I kan stille det på engelsk også. Det er frit valg. Øh, svarene skal vi nok sørge for at komme og retur ud, enten gennem chatten eller ud i broadcast til alle. Vi optager jo et præsentation. For dem, som ikke er i stand til at følge med i dag, jamen, så ligger vi den på vores YouTube-kanal, så man kan følge med på et senere tidspunkt eller dele med nogle af sine løbevinder. Men øh, tanken var egentlig, at nu vil vi gå i gang. Vi mangler stadigvæk nogen af dem, som har meldt sig til. Vi er i størrelsesordenen halvdelen, godt og vel, af dem, som har meldt sig til webinar, som nu har joinet. Men erfaringsmæssigt går der typisk nogle minutter i op mod 10 minutter, før de fleste har fået logget ind. Så øh, jeg håber, at øh, I bærer med os, at vi faktisk går i gang nu. Så øh, Mark Wolf, please introduce yourself. That's way better than me doing it. And also bear in mind that Mark is actually now in Johannesburg in South Africa, more than 13,000 kilometers away, but still here with us. So Mark, I, I already introduced the theme of the webinar in, uh, in Danish, and I know that uh, you know, the web is actually yours now, so please. Uh, thank you very much, Mikkel, and uh, thank you all of you for attending. And um, I don't know what Mikkel said now in Danish, because my Danish is terrible, um, but uh, I will try and speak actually slowly because uh, I mean I know you all speak English pretty well, um, but I, I generally speak quite quickly. So I'm going to try and uh, just uh, keep the pace nice and comfortable so that you all understand what I'm trying to say and get across. And if there are any questions, you can ask them in Danish. Mikkel will answer. I'm sure he's already mentioned that. Um, I'm also available to answer as well. So. This presentation is slightly different from other presentations because specifically Mikkel asked me to do something that's targeted more to half marathon and um, what I've done is I've actually put a presentation together with, which deals really in general with nutrition and fueling and we can talk you know, more towards the end uh, specifics around half marathon fueling and uh, you'll see why when we, when we get to that stage. So I'm going to run through the slides. Um, And this session is being recorded. I think Mikkel might have mentioned that. So it will be made available after, um, after the session. Okay, so the agenda for this evening is, um, I'm just going to do a little introduction, which is uh, food for thought. Uh, just a few quotes. Uh, People underestimate nutrition. And I wanted to just uh, state very clearly how critical it actually is. And I'll give you a few quotes that are, that are quite uh, close to my heart. Um, on the sports nutrition side, um, I'm going to talk about how one should be eating for training and racing. Uh, we're going to focus on things like recovery, hydration, um, carbohydrates uh, considerations, and different food types. Um, and then I'm going to provide a, a few slides on suggested fueling. So, so what to do the week before a race, the day before a race, and then obviously on race day. And uh, then we will have a question and answer session 
and uh, and we can take it from there. So on the food for thought, these are just some quotes which um, which basically I uh, I think are quite nice. Um, and this is something that I quite like. You can spend as many hours as you want training, but if you don't eat correctly, sooner or later trouble is going to come knocking at your door. And um, I've seen it with many athletes across the globe. They put their bodies under a lot of stress, and uh, they don't get enough sleep, and they definitely don't support it from a nutrition point of view. And eventually illness and injury actually came knocking at the door. And that's something that I, I stress very, very uh, much. Once it's past your lips, you have lost all possible means of control. And this is something that I always tell um, my clients that I help with nutrition. The choice is yours, what to eat. But once you put it in your mouth, whatever it does to your body is out of your control. So the, 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 the point of selection is actually when it's in your hands and about to come to your lips. You need to decide, is this going to be a benefit to me or is it going to be a detriment to me? And that is a, a decision that is uh, directly in your hands. If fitness came in a bottle, everyone would have a great body. And this is a quote by Sher, and I quite like this one because I deal with a lot of athletes that, or even age group of athletes that are always thinking there's a quick fix. And I always tell them there are no quick fixes. Uh, to get fit, to get lean, to stay healthy requires a lot of dedication and a lot of work. And there is no quick quick way out. It, it, is, it is dedication and work. It doesn't matter how fit, fast, or strong you are. If you don't focus on your nutrition, you will never reach your full potential. And this is something that's very important um, to take into consideration. Whether you're a professional athlete or an amateur athlete, it, it doesn't make a difference how many times you stand on the podium, or even if you're an eight and a half hour Ironman athlete or a 75 minute a half marathon athlete. There's a possibility that you can improve upon your personal best, and that you can do even better. Assuming that your nutrition is down pat, and, and that's why I stress, nutrition can make a difference. It's a fact that it can increase the percentage of performance, and it can definitely, definitely make a difference in, uh, in, 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 in a lot of things, not just health and lifestyle, but definitely what you, what you can achieve. And then one last quote, a man too busy to take care of his health is like a mechanic too busy to take care of his tools. Um, I always stress health must always come first, always listen to the body. Um, nutrition plays a very critical role there. You should be eating according to what is suitable to your body. Not every person is the same. Um, and just as a simple example, I mean, some people are allergic to certain products. Some people are allergic to wheat. Some people to dairy. And I just feel that uh, if you are, if you do have an allergy towards something, you should listen to your messages and you should avoid those those uh, potential foods, which can actually potentially cause harm because. Um, basically, the reason you're eating it is because you enjoy it. It's an emotional craving, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, it's it's good for you or it's going to benefit you. So I feel that uh, your health should come first, and the messages that your body gives you, you should listen to. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an introduction. Let's uh, look at the sports nutrition side of things. Um, first of all, when it comes to sports nutrition um, or determining whatever kind of nutrition you want to eat, you first need to decide what kind of an athlete you are. Obviously, I think most of you are runners. I deal with all different types of athletes, and really nutrition will vary depending on the kind of disciplines that they do. And then what is the goal of you as an athlete? Are you looking to do a short-distance event, a medium or a long-distance event, an ultra-distance event? Do you exercise for weight loss, for fitness, or for general health? Because if these are your goals, this will determine the kind of nutrition that you will probably select. And then I get asked very often, and this is really more in line with where we're going, how should I be eating before, during, and after a training or a racing session? And, and when I bring this up, there's a lot of different kinds of topics or, or different kinds of attributes that need to be taken into account. And there's a, there's a number of things that I want to discuss, and I've broken this question down because a lot of people don't think about the various aspects of the kind of nutrition or the kind of feeling they should be using because they don't take into consideration a number of things. And these are what time is a training or racing session? So meal timing is very critical. Are you going to be training early in the morning? Um, are you going to be training in the afternoon? And, uh, and if so, they will require different feeling strategies. Early in the morning, you could actually, depending on the time uh, that you're going to get up and train and the distance you're going to train, 
you might not need to consume anything beforehand. Um, but if it's in the late morning and you've woken up early, you might want to fuel yourself before that training session. Uh, if it's a long session, you definitely might want to fuel yourself uh, before as well in order to provide you some stability. Um, personally, I believe that if it's an early morning session, uh, I think you can actually pretty much go on water for anything up to 90 minutes to two hours, um, assuming that you're not going to be training later on, and we'll get into that shortly. The other thing you need to look at is the weather conditions. So obviously if it's cold, um, you might hydrate less. If it's hot, you might need to hydrate more. And, uh, and so the time of training actually plays a very critical, critical role, something you need to take into account. The time of the session, how long are you going to be training for? And I just, mentioned, I just touched on this, so a 60 minute session, is it a medium session, maybe up to two hours, or is it a long session, three hours and over? And uh, like I mentioned before, I think uh, early morning sessions, anything up to, to 90 minutes, um, pretty much I, I'm a very, very much a big fan of, uh, of, of, of actually water fueling for those periods of time because it makes you a more fat efficient athlete. And um, anything that might go over 90 minutes to two hours or over two hours, you might start to look at a different kind of a fueling, um, depending on how fat efficient you are. Um, then I would start looking at maybe pre-fueling uh, for a little bit of stability and still trying to, to maximize fat usage. Um, but if you're going for a longer period at a high intensity, then you might start to want to introduce some maybe quicker or, or more carbohydrate feeds into that session. And for obviously for long sessions, three hours and over, um, there are people that would need to take some sort of maybe pre-training meal and some people can get through a session uh, that's over three hours with just a pre-training meal, and there are some athletes that require fueling during a three-hour session. And um, so the length of the time of the session is something that you also need to take into account. And then the intensity of the session, and um, this means the pace that you're performing at and the length of the session are going to actually ultimately determine the type of fuel that's required. And the reason I say um, the intensity is because when you're performing at a very high intensity, it's very difficult to eat. Um, some, some athletes would prefer to keep the airways open. Um, some athletes can actually get away with, uh, with uh, eating food solids because they're running at a more controlled pace or performing at a more controlled pace, and the airways are not performing very intensely, so they actually have got the ability to chew. Um, but an elite athlete generally would prefer more of a liquid feed. And the type of carbohydrates that you use, again, depend on the kind of pace that you, you're going at. If you're going at a stability or control pace, you'd prefer to fuel it with a stability carbohydrate. If you're going at a very high intensity, uh, then I would recommend something like a fast-releasing carbohydrate that gets into the system a lot quicker. So, so, so that will generally, uh, uh, session time and session intensity are the two most critical factors to take into account. Another factor is when is your next training session? And there are athletes that do one session a day, the athletes that do two sessions a day, and there's even athletes that do a triple session, a triple training session. Um, call those Kenyan days in actual fact. But those are the more elite or the more serious athletes that would do something like that. But when you are going to train, and if you're going to train in the morning and you are going to have a double session, then depending on the length of that session and maybe the intensity of that session, you would probably ultimately prefer to fuel maybe before and during because you will need to recover for the following session. And if you don't fuel during that session at all and you actually go out on water and it is a fairly intense session, you will probably deplete some of your glycogen stores. It will probably lead to a little bit of fatigue and you probably won't be able to give the next session much a quality session. And if you push yourself well at the next session as well, by the following day you might hit a point of fatigue. So you always need to look at what you're training next. Um, if it's the following day, you've got more room for movement and flexibility as far as nutrition goes. But if it's a session the same day, or two sessions the same day after that morning session, you definitely need to focus on your fueling strategy because you need to recover for your next session. There's no point in training if you cannot put in a quality session. And then we look at things like fuel type. So when it comes to athletes, I mentioned this earlier on, liquid feed or food solids or both. And this really completely depends on your, on your pace and your digestive ability. So an athlete, like I mentioned earlier, that's performing at a very high intensity will ultimately prefer a liquid feed. There are some athletes, though, that do perform at a high intensity, but they start out at a controlled pace. So 
an athlete for running a marathon, for example, might start out at a more controlled pace and actually start to turn the pace up in the second half of the marathon. So in the beginning, they might look at a solid feed, uh, maybe taking in some, uh, some food solids, which our bodies are far more adapted to. And the reason I say that is because we eat food solids during the day. We don't live on, on shakes only. Well, at least I hope you don't. But, um, but uh, taking food solids, our, our digestive systems are probably much more uh, welcoming to food solids. Obviously, though, when you're performing at a very high intensity, especially when you're running, uh, the digestive tracts are put under a lot of stress, and um, it's not so easy to consume food solids that uh, you have to sit and chew on for a long period of time. So in that case, maybe food solids that are, are quick and easy to get down are a lot more suited. And as the pace picks up and as your breathing intensifies, you'd probably want to look more for, for, a, for a liquid feed. But this is really personalized. There are some elite athletes that I work with that prefer a solid, a solid feed. I don't know why, but they do. And there are some athletes that prefer a liquid feed. And last night, I actually did a, I did a very big talk at, um, at one of the top running clubs in the country here. And um, we had uh, some comrades, marathon winners, which is the biggest ultra in South Africa. It's a 90-kilometer ultra. Um, in actual fact, the winning times are run at uh, 340 pace. So they run at 340 pace for five and a half hours. It is a very, very fast pace for that period of time. And uh, one of the ladies there is Caroline Bosman. She won the Two Oceans Marathon, the 56-kilometer ultra last week. Uh, had a phenomenal run. And interestingly enough, um, her last 14 Ks were very fast. I think she ran the last 14 Ks in about 52 minutes. Um, and she was very controlled in her running in the beginning. But en route, um, I mean, she, used, she, is, she is basically sponsored by us. So she uses some of our drinks en route, etc. But uh, she, when she felt like something to eat and there wasn't a second there for her, she would nibble on a potato. So maybe a bite of a potato or a bite of banana, just keeping the blood sugar nice and stable, not outpacing herself, and really just drip feeding and taking in um, uh, some products along the route. And only in the last, uh, say, 10 to 14 days does she up her pace incredibly. And at that stage, she wasn't really eating many solids, but she was really only just taking in liquid feed, keeping her body cool. So, so there's an example of an athlete that actually uses a combination of, of food solids and uh, liquid feed um, during a run. Some of our elite athletes that we spoke to last night, is, even those comrades athletes that, running, uh, that are running 90 kilometers at 3.40 pace, um, Ludwig Mamabolo, who won comrades in 2012, uh, uh, basically said that uh, there, was no, um, there was no ways that he would be able to take in a food solid and his reason being that if he had time to chew on a food solid, he would actually lose the bunch. And uh, he said it's that split second that he just can't waste time. He needs to get the food down. He needs to get it quickly. He needs to focus on the racing strategy. So, so just interesting, the differences between liquid feed and, and, and solid feed and a combination of the two. And in the end, it really, really depends on, on the kind of athlete you are. One of the very important factors that... Um, that, that I, I always stress as well, it's probably the most critical factor when it comes to sports nutrition is actually recovery nutrition. And um, when it comes to recovery nutrition, I really stress it because even if you go out and train on water um, and you are going to do a session later on in the day, your most critical meal of the day is actually a recovery meal. And there's, 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 a, there's four types of recovery that I stress. Um, and these four main types of recovery, a lot of people don't really think about in terms of recovery, but they are considered forms of recovery. The first is rehydration, and this is replacement of lost fluid. Um, that's the first step in, in recovery. Um, when you're going um, on a long session or even on a short session, you are going to lose a, a certain amount of fluid. There is no way during a session you can replace the exact amount of fluid being lost. Um, you'll always be at a slight deficit, and you can still perform uh, dehydrated up to a certain percentage. However, um, overhydration is the worst possible scenario you could actually land up in and uh, you would never want to be at that state because it actually can be dangerous to, to your health and sometimes life-threatening. So lo uh, fluid loss um, and fluid replacement are, are, are two factors that uh, need to be considered. So with recovery, just make sure that post-exercise you do hydrate sufficiently um, and, uh, and generally um, you can tell if you've hydrated sufficiently and that is definitely by the color of your urine. Um, if, if it's very, very, very dark, then you, you ultimately know that there is, a, there is an issue as far as hydration goes. It needs to be a very pale color. Um, 
some people take a lot of multivitamins, etc., and that can change the color, and uh, so it's just something that needs to be monitored. The second kind of recovery is what I call glycogen replenishment, and this really depends on the kind of um, intensity that you're performing at. And um, I'm just sorry, I'm just seeing that somebody said we've lost lost sound. Uh, Mikkel, I mean, can is it? Do I need to go back a slide? Mark, we, we lost you for like 10 seconds, so I think you maybe just, just one minute back, then it would be perfect. That's not a problem. So I was talking about fluid replacement, I think, is that where I was? And rehydration. So I was just saying that um, when it comes to fluid loss, uh, it's very critical that we replace the fluid that's lost post-exercise. Uh, we should never, ever try and replace the amount of fluid lost during exercise. You'll never reach the exact same amount, but you can you can replace a percentage of it. However, post-exercise, you'll definitely be at a slight deficit, and it's really important to rehydrate yourself. And the way to test that is to actually just look at the color of your urine, and, and you'll be able to tell if you're dehydrated, it'll be very, very dark. Um, if you are properly hydrated, it'll be a very pale color. And a lot of people get confused because they take in a lot of multivitamins. And um, when they do take in a lot of multivitamins, it actually skews the color of the urine and gives it a bright yellow color, not to be confused with dehydration. Um, generally, it will disappear, and you can monitor that through the day. The, the next type of recovery is called glycogen replenishment, which is, I mean, our term is glycogen replenishment, and that depends on the, the session length and the intensity of the session. Uh, if you have performed at a very high intensity and you haven't fueled yourself uh, uh, maybe you haven't uh, fueled yourself with a, a lot of carbohydrates during that session, you will probably deplete your glycogen levels, um, not necessarily full, completely, but to a certain percentage. And then post-exercise, you would need to take in some carbohydrates in order to be able to replenish those glycogen levels. And this is really, especially if you're going to be doing a session that day, or have you got consecutive days of sessions that you're going to be training. I had an athlete once on day one, he started to deplete his glycogen levels. Um, actually, he was doing a stage race, and he never replenished them properly on day one. Day two, he depleted them more, and on day three, he completely emptied his tank, and he actually lost, it was a, a four-day stage race, he lost about uh, 17 places on day three. On day four, he could definitely not make it up. And the reason being that his nutrition post-exercise or post-session was quite poor. So if you ever do land up in a state of fatigue, um, Sometimes it can be nutrition related, and sometimes you just need to take maybe a day or two's rest, um, re-nutrify yourself, uh, focus on the nutrition, get the, the minerals and the vitamins back into the body, and, uh, and let your body recuperate so that you can carry on. Mark, I just just have one question coming in, which I, I answered uh, directly, but I might have you comment as well, which is if, if I'm running a marathon and not just a half marathon, the same advice is kind of uh, echo. Yeah. Um, you use the same advice that we're giving here, right? I, I think what I've spoken on currently, marathon and half marathon will be very similar. The only difference is is that um, most athletes, well, unless you're Kenyan, don't really run at exactly half marathon pace for a full marathon. Uh, generally, it, uh, mar I mean, it depends on the pace you're running at. And, um, and obviously, in a marathon, I mean, most people like to try and sort of get into a rhythm and control the pace in the first half. and and then by the time they get to the second half. But if you're running a marathon in, in, in under three hours, your fueling is a lot more simple probably than a marathon that's going to run a marathon in four to five hours. Um, because the time, the, the, the time is going to play a very critical role in the kind of fueling that you take in. You can pretty much get away with a two and a half to three hour marathon on little fueling. But, um, and, and relying on more of a pre-race uh, meal and just making sure you hydrate properly and taking in carbs here or there will actually help. But if you're going to be running a, a full marathon and it's going to be four or five hours, now your body, you actually do run the risk of actually hitting a big sugar low. And uh, you need to make sure that your your pre-race meal is sufficient and that the timing of that is sufficient. And you need to make sure that you eat early on. Because when it gets late on in the day, you probably won't want to eat as much. And you'll probably rely a little bit on um, fluid feeds here or there, depending on what's en route. And uh, at that stage, if you have spared your glycogen stores as much as possible, 
you actually feel comfortable at the finish. But um, if not, and you deplete them too early on, because you haven't eaten sufficiently early on, you are going to suffer further down. So really, the difference between a half marathon and a full marathon is uh, is really just time. And like I mentioned earlier, your glycogen stores can see you easily for 90 minutes. For a very well-trained athlete, your glycogen stores can see you even up to two hours, um, depending on, on how well-trained you are. Um, most half marathons that I personally do or that most of our elites do, I mean, if you're running under 90 minutes, um, you could pretty much go on, on really nothing. If your glycogen stores are topped up, you have a pre pre race meal, uh, which is sufficient, and uh, in a half marathon of that of that time, um, you would be able to actually get away pretty much with water. But in order to get the brain the brain uh, the brain uh, functioning nicely, sometimes it does crave sugar. Um, it's not necessarily going to be used for firing muscles uh, because you've got glycogen, which is more quickly accessible. So in that case, um, you know, taking a little bit of sugar on route in the form of fluids will actually be fine. But anybody running a half marathon, you know, in two hours or over is going to need a different feeding strategy. But I'll go into that in more detail as we go further down, and then we can take some more questions if that's okay. Um, on the recovery side, the third, the third um, element of recovery is, uh, is blood glucose stabilization. And, um, and this is where an athlete's been running maybe just on water or maybe hasn't fueled sufficiently or even has fueled to a certain extent. But regardless, they've burnt off enough calories and they've uh, lowered their blood sugar and the insulin levels are, are, are probably very, very low that when they, they finish, they've they, they have suddenly got these hunger cravings or these sugar cravings. And the reason being is that your body just needs, you need to get nutrients back into the system. So in order to stabilize your blood sugar, you should eat immediately or have a recovery shake immediately post-exercise. I always recommend within 15 minutes. And I'm not talking about getting protein into the system for recovery because that's not what it's about. The, the first 15 to 20 minutes for me is actually stabilizing the blood sugar, getting away, getting some nutrients into the system which will immediately be utilized it then gives you time to actually maybe shower, stretch, shower, do whatever, and then actually eat a post-training, a proper recovery meal after that, which is completely different to that immediate shake. So, so, so that's what I talk about the blood glucose stabilization. It's just immediately stabilizing the blood sugar. Generally at a race, they will give you a sugar drink at the finish line, and that's generally to rehydrate and to stabilize or, or restabilize your blood, your blood glucose levels. And then the final one is muscle resynthesis. And um, obviously muscles require support and repair, especially after a hard interval session or a track session or whenever you've done uh, quite a difficult session. And um, the quite, quite, something that's quite interesting is many people think that you need to consume protein immediately after exercise in order to benefit that from the window period. And it's not necessarily true. You can take protein really within two hours after you finished your exercise and, and it will still be utilized for that recovery process. I think protein post-exercise really stabilizes your, your satiatory receptors. It actually keeps you feeling fuller for longer. So protein is really good to get into the system. It does take away the hunger. Um, it's a scientific fact that uh, um, the word recover as far as protein goes has never ever been proven. and uh, in actual fact, EFSA law, which is European Food Safety Authority regulations, have stated you are not allowed to use the claim that protein aids recovery post-exercise. It does not. Um, it forms part of muscle resynthesis when the body needs the protein to resynthesize the muscles. And the protein required to resynthesize muscle is the amount of protein that you consume from the time that you wake up in the morning until the time you go to sleep at night. So the body will use what it wants. And for an endurance athlete, generally, I recommend taking either 1 to 1.4 grams per kilogram of body weight of protein per day uh, for an endurance athlete. Um, if you're trying to get a little bit more leaner and a little bit more uh, lean muscle mass, you might want to go even up to about 1.4 to 1.7, depending on your physique. Um, and, uh, and generally, you'll get bodybuilders and uh, uh, that go even up to about 3 grams per, kilo, uh, per kilogram of body weight. So it's, it's quite a lot. So you're looking at 1 to 1.4 grams per kilo of body weight. Generally, for a run or endurance athlete, that's more than sufficient. A lot of people overeat protein. There's no need to do that. Um, the, the human body is only capable of absorbing and utilizing probably around 25 grams of protein per three hours. So if you're going to have 40 grams of protein immediately after exercise, 
um, you might be able to absorb a percentage of that, but the rest is going to go to waste. And what happens to protein when it's not being absorbed? It gets processed. It cannot be stored. And when it gets processed, it will generally be converted into glucose. Glucose will be utilized to top up your glycogen stores. If your glycogen stores are topped up, it will be stored as fat. And that's just a, that's just a medical fact. It's how the body works in a physiological way. So protein, I would just say, monitor what you need to take in on a daily basis, depending on how active you are. Um, it is nice to take it post-exercise with a carbohydrate to help with recovery, and um, uh, but it doesn't have to be taken in large amounts. So I would say up to 25 grams of protein is fine. Uh, with a carbohydrate, that will stabilize blood sugar, get the hunger cravings going, and it will give your body enough protein for a couple of hours to utilize. Um, we spoke about hydration we just touched on it a little bit, and this is a very important factor with leading up to an endurance event. Um, and one of the things that I always stress is you really need to focus on proper hydration. If you land up running a race and your body is not 100% hydrated, you will actually you probably land up suffering during that race. You want to get to the start line feeling uh, completely hydrated, and hydrated means fluid in the muscles, not fluid in the stomach. So hydration needs to be looked at on a daily basis, and generally. For most people, I recommend 30 to 40 milliliters per kilogram of body weight uh, per day. So that means if you weigh 60 kilograms, you're looking at around 2 liters of fluid per day. And not in the form of coffee. I prefer in the form of maybe herbal teas or, um, or, or actually water. Um, and not in the form of fruit juices either, unless it's like freshly squeezed lemon in some water. But, I mean, then obviously you've got to worry about the sugar as well. So you want to arrive at the event properly hydrated, ensure you drink consistently through the days leading up to the event, and um, definitely, definitely do not think of alcohol as any, by any means um, of a form of hydration. Alcohol completely, with sugar alcohol, is completely dehydrate the body, and it's not something that you, that you, want, to, uh, that you want to happen before an event. In actual fact, uh, I, I tell athletes that at least a week to 10 days before an event, you shouldn't be drinking any alcohol at all. And the interesting thing is drinking alcohol post-event, the celebration of beers, it actually slows down the recovery process significantly. Because you need to be hydrated for proper recovery, and you're putting sugar alcohols into your body, and it is going to impact the recovery process. So generally, wait. it's nice to wait 24, 48 hours afterwards, and then go and have your glass of wine or your beers. Um, another thing that I always stress to athletes is you have to separate between hydration versus energy. And I've just put this picture here as a simple example because um, it, doesn't really, it doesn't necessarily impact runners as per se, but you know, cyclists and, and triathletes, maybe it will impact them more. But the thing is, is that when, when it's cold weather, and let's say you're putting calories into your bottle in the form of fluid, and you're relying on those calories, and it's cold, and you're not going to, let's say you've been relying on drinks on roots, and you're not even going to drink that much because you're not going to sweat out that much fluid because the temperature's dropped. It means that those calories are not going to be coming into your system. And so you're going to land up in a calorie deficit. You're not going to be taking an amount of grams of carbohydrate or calories that you want per an hour because it's cold and you're drinking less and you're relying on calories in the fluid. So you're actually going to probably end up with a sugar low and eventually maybe glycogen depletion and hitting the wall. So it's very important to separate between energy and hydration. On a hot day, you've got no issues because you'll probably drink more than the amount of calories when it's sitting in fluid. So very much temperature dependent. Um, always, always analyze what time your race is, what the temperatures are going to be. Try and see if a liquid feed is suitable for you. Um, if not, I mean, I mean, one of the things I always tell people as well is with gel consumption. Gels generally should be taken with, the, with a certain amount of water to help with the absorption dilution and absorption. Um, gels are extremely concentrated, so sometimes so there are certain gels on the market that if you take them without water, you land up with GI distress or stomach issues. Um, there are some gels that you can take with, with only a very little bit of water. So again, if, if, you, if you are using a gel and uh, it's extremely concentrated and you're worried about having to consume fluid with it, then just don't take the entire gel at once split the gel feed over a period of time to ease it on the digestive system, and then you take little bits of water at a time. So just an idea for, for anybody that, that's ever tried that. Um, and then food solids versus liquids. I mean, we've, I'm not going to go through this again, but um, just some of the advantages that I've listed around food solids, um, you're putting much more fuel into the digestive system, and our bodies are 
adapted to eating food solids. Um, it, it does give you a sense of comfort. It takes away the hunger. It gives you a sense of fullness and stability and also enjoyment. Uh, solid foods generally are more enjoyable than liquid foods. But uh, with liquids, I've mentioned earlier, the intensity of the raised breathing patterns really will determine comfort of food selection. So high pace makes it difficult to chew. Um, when it comes to foods such as high fiber foods, they should be limited. And um, also high protein foods should be limited. So you need to try and find a balance, um, uh, you know, as to, depending on what's suitable to your system. A lot of people ask me how many carbohydrates I should be taking in per an hour. And uh, there's a big debate whether it's 60 to 90 grams of carbs per an hour. In all honesty, this is more for somebody that digestive system is actually more stable. So somebody that's actually sitting on a bicycle, more like a triathlete or a cyclist, is it probably a lot easier to get in that amount of carbohydrates in an hour. Most runners don't get anywhere near that. In actual fact, runners generally take, from what we, the measurements that we've done, anywhere from 25 to probably 55 grams of carbohydrates per an hour because when you're running, your digestive system is far more sensitive and, um, and when you're running, you actually, there just seems to be a lot more control as far as the digestive system goes and, and, and we find that runners are generally far more fat efficient. They need less carbs to actually go a little bit further. So I don't see a necessity to take in anywhere around 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour. The other thing is it's very easy to shove um, 60 or 90 grams of carbs into your system. But the question you need to ask yourself is, is my body capable of utilizing, digesting, absorbing those carbohydrates? So it's important to understand that it's not about how many carbs you're putting in your mouth. It's about how many carbs your body is capable of utilizing and absorbing. And everybody's different. So you need to actually find what works for you. You practice in training, you train the gut, and you do exactly in training as you you do exactly in the race as you would in the training. Uh, don't ever change because because uh, that's the worst thing you can do. So let's just look at how you can structure a nutrition program or a sports nutrition sort of program for your big race day. And like I just mentioned now, nutrition has to be planned. It's not something that uh, you can arrive on race day without a plan in mind. And I, interestingly enough, even at some of the ultras that I stand at, with an expo, people come up to me and they say to me, can you help me? I'm running a 90-kilometer ultra and I don't know what to do. And I just want to, I want to go mad at them because I'm thinking to myself, you've had six months to prepare for this event. How can you leave your nutrition to the day of the race, to the day before the race? It is a terrible place to be. And a lot of people say, oh, I just want to finish the race. And it's not a matter of you just want to finish. <laughs> when you're going to run 90Ks or 21Ks or even 10Ks, when you finish the race, you want to finish feeling okay and that you've done at least something, uh, uh, that you, you've done it in the best possible way that you can, but also that you're, feeling, you're not feeling ill and you're not feeling sick and you're actually feeling good at the finish. So the rules of engagement is always test your nutrition during training. Um, take notice of what you're consuming during training in the form of... Uh, of the liquids and solids under various weather conditions. Take note of the energy levels before, during, at the end of your session. Um, that's always a very good sign. If you finish a, a session strong, it's a very good sign that you actually uh, um, have fueled yourself sufficiently. Um, and once you're satisfied, test it out. Pick a long training session which will mimic your race session and, um, and eat what you would eat as a pre-training meal. Eat what you would eat during a training session and uh, you can go out you know, fairly hard, slightly below your race pace, and see how you feel at the finish. If you feel strong, well, then you can bank your nutrition, and, and that should actually be quite suitable for you. So always practice in training what you're going to do in your racing session. Once you get to the race, stick to it. Mark, we have one question which I also answered, but it might be that you have a comment, which is we have one runner who's, been, who's been experiencing cramps in the stomach during a half marathon previously and might uh, it might be because of uh, the type or amount of carbohydrates or energy gels. Have you, have you got a comment on that one? Yeah, look, I mean, stomach cramps are, are, are very common. So generally, stomach cramps usually occur in athletes that are running at a, at a fairly high, high intensity. Um, their digestive systems are more susceptible to, to cramping. And the reason is, is that um, they're taking something into the system which is actually not being pulled into the body. In other words, it's not being, uh, it doesn't exit the digestive tracts um, because it, it just, it just it's, it's, the, the dilution rate, etc., is not there. And what actually happens is it actually 
causes a concentrate of glucose in the stomach or the digestive tracts and actually lands up causing severe stomach cramps. And it's usually, it's, it can also be leftover food solids that somebody's eaten or pre-raised meal which hasn't digested sufficiently. So it could be something that's traced back to there. But I can give you an example. I mean, I do a lot of product testing. And um, about two years ago when we were developing our gel, I was testing other gels on the market because I wanted to test um, for taste and I wanted to test for comfort. And uh, there was one particular gel, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there was one particular gel that I took at the end of my marathon in the last kilometer um, just, to, just to get a feel for the taste. I wanted to taste the gel. And, um, and within two minutes after consuming it, I had the most severe stomach cramps. I mean, I made it through the finish line, but it was a very uncomfortable situation. And, um, and I realized that the, this, the, the, the makeup of the two carbohydrates in this gel was so concentrated that my digestive system did not allow for it to, to be absorbed sufficiently. And so one of the things that I, I specifically do when I design products, so, I, mean, I, do, I mean, I do work on design on, on for example, 32GR products, is I specifically test for digestive comfort. It is the most critical thing for any athlete. But generally, um, the, the way to deal with the di digestive discomfort is to, first of all, start to analyze the foods that you've been taking before the event. Um, the best way to test if those foods are okay is to actually eat a meal like that before a training session and only run on water. So see how your stomach feels just with a pre-training meal. If, that, if, if you're fine with that, then you know now that it's the race fuel that you need to look at. Then try fueling with those things during training and even try some high-intensity sessions at the track to see how your digestive system will, will function under stress. But there are a lot of people that suffer from, uh, it can be fructose intolerance or highly concentrated uh, um, sort of glucose uh, mixed uh, kinds of gels. And I mean, I've got some athletes now, um, they're actually cyclists and um, they, um, they're international cyclists, they're riding the Tour de France. And as an example, there's about, I think there's about five of them. They're using a specific brand and um, unfortunately they, they get severe stomach issues from that particular brand. And nobody knows really why. Um, there are other brands that are suited to their stomach, but that particular one actually, which is quite well known, and a lot of people use it and, and are, are fine with it, but that particular brand is just causing these five cyclists severe stomach issues. And again, it's just, it's, it's a, every, something that I need to stress is that every single person is uniquely different. We, we're all unique. We, We've got our own genetic structures, our own makeups, and the way our digestive systems function, and uh, the kind of foods that we we like to eat, and the kind of foods that uh, our bodies welcome, and the kind of foods that they reject, all play a very critical role. And what works for one person is not necessarily going to work for the next. So again, you, the only way to avoid something like that is test it in training, and then when it comes to racing, stick with it. Don't try anything new on the race day. Um, that, the, that you haven't tried in training. And I think that that's the best way to try and overcome something like that. Um, the only other issues that would cause it is obviously stomach bug or stomach virus. And there are things that irritate the stomach. Uh, one of them is caffeine. Um, the other is, uh, is, is dairy. And uh, wheat or gluten is, is another that can irritate. So you can look at those few things and, 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 and see if it does, uh, if it does help. So I'll touch on that a little bit more, if, if that's okay, I'll just carry on here. So suggested fueling, the week before an event is a very critical week. People underestimate how important nutrition is. Um, you shouldn't be taking out takeaway foods, which are especially fat-laden foods, etc. Alcohol should be avoided. Caffeine should be avoided, not because it's bad for you, but because caffeine actually can play a benefit for you. Um, and I'll talk about the caffeine benefits a little bit later on. Um, you should eat normal and healthy balanced meals. So try and up your vegetable intake, uh, uh, eat more lean proteins, eat your healthy fats, um, try and eat more healthy and balanced meals. Make sure you hydrate properly. We spoke about hydration and don't overeat. Whatever you do, don't overeat. Remember, in, in race week, you're tapering. If you overeat, you're going to gain weight because your volume of training is far less. And if you gain weight and you've got to run 21 kilometers, even on 200 or 300 grams more of body weight, you actually risk um, injury, that's one thing, or you're not going to have the most comfortable race because you're having to drag around an extra few hundred grams, which can make a big difference over a 21 kilometer distance. It does make a big difference. Um, so just make sure that you don't overeat because you don't want to gain weight the week of the, 
of the rods. And when people ask me about carbo loading, I don't believe in carbo loading because when you are tapering and you're eating normally and you have reduced your volume of training, your glycogen stores will automatically be topped up. And you can't overtop them. Your glycogen stores, you've got a, you've got a level that when they're topped up, those glycogen stores are going to see you. Um, if you over carb load and you try and, uh, and take in too many carbohydrates a day, you risk weight gain, and weight gain will set you back um, far more. So there's no, there's no necessity for that. It's, it's a very old school um, type of thinking. The only reason that I tell people um, if, they, if they really want to uh, try and carb load, um, I actually tell them to try and take in like maybe a half a serving of a very low, uh, like a sort of a low insulin response carbohydrate drink. I mean, we use our Endure just as an example, but the reason I like them to do them, to drink two bottles a day three days before the event, is actually not for the carbohydrates at all because it's such a small amount. It's actually to hydrate the body. And the carbohydrate with the water will maximize the absorption rate of that fluid and get it into the system. And my focus would be more, more targeted towards re to hydrating for the event as opposed to getting uh, your carbohydrate stores topped up because they should be when, you, when you're in a taper phase. Um, the day before the event, you need to keep eating clean, keep hydrating properly, avoid caffeine, um, especially because you want to get a good night's sleep that night and taking in too much caffeine can impact your sleep. Uh, race nerves definitely clown you. Your nighttime meal should be small and comfortable. I get a lot of people overeating the night before a race. They're all into this carb loading thing again. And the problem is, is then you lie in bed with a very full stomach and a very uncomfortable stomach and you really battle to fall asleep. So I think it's very important to stress. Don't eat a big meal at night. You, it's not going to benefit you. You've got many, many hours before the race. The most important meal before your race is the morning of, is the pre-race meal. And, and, and that's definitely far more critical than the night time before. So just focus on eating a small, comfortable meal that you can get a good night's sleep. Uh, suggested fueling for pre-race meal. Um, your meal should be eaten at least two hours before an event. And if it is two hours before, a meal of about 400 calories is sufficient. For every two hours more you go before the event, you can actually nearly double that. So if you're going to eat four hours before an event, you can actually go up to an 800 calorie meal. Um, and it depends on the time of the race. If you're dealing with a Tour de France cyclist, their races only start sometimes 10, 11 in the morning. So there's no issue with them eating a really big uh, pre-race meal, up to 1,000 calories even before the event. But if you're going to be racing at 6 o'clock in the morning and you've got to wake up at half past 3 and eat your meal at 4, so then you keep it at around 400 calories. Um, it should be a combination of carbohydrates, protein, and fat, not just carbohydrates. Um, the protein and fat definitely will play a role. It will help with stabilization. Fat is also a source of fuel. Um, but obviously the meal can be a higher carb portion. Um, but rather use stability carbs. Don't need, no need to spike your blood sugar so early on. Um, when you get to the start of the race, if it's a 10K, you can spike your blood sugar. If it's a 21K and you're going to run it in 70, 75 minutes, you can spike your blood sugar. If it's a 21K and you're going to run it in two hours or three hours, do not spike your blood sugar. In that case, you need to keep it stable uh, because the minute you spark it, you're going to need to run at a very high intensity to get rid of that glucose. And, um, and if, from a physiological perspective, just to explain to you how the body works, if you are running at a controlled pace and you're breathing comfortably, it means you've got the ability to utilize your fat stores um, because in actual fact, fat, all fat needs to convert into, into uh, well, in short, into ATP is actually oxygen. That's all it requires. So if your breathing is, uh, is sufficient and you can even talk while you're running, well, then there's no reason for you to spike your blood sugar whatsoever. But if you're puffing and panting and you can barely get oxygen in and you definitely cannot talk, then you know you need to take in a quicker release in carbohydrates um, because uh, there's, no, there's definitely no way there's sufficient oxygen in the system to, to be able to break down fat and utilize it as a source of energy. So from a physiological perspective, your intensity will determine the kind of carbohydrates you take in uh, as a, as a, from a fuel point of view. Some suggested meals I've actually put in here, and I mean, like I said, this session's recorded, so you're welcome to use these afterwards. Um, we actually have got a, a product guide where I've got some suggested pre-race meals and um, some post-recovery meals, which, uh, which is actually online. You can always download it. And um, so I've put some here, and you can see these meals are around the 390, 420, sort of 30 calorie mark. And like I said, around 400 calories per, per meal is actually fine. 
I've just put some options here. I put a rolled oats option um, uh, with some blueberries, with some protein, etc. Um, I've put in this for people that like toast, um, some almond and macadamia nut butter and bananas. I've put in a, a smoothie recipe as well. Some people like to eat eggs um, on toast. Uh, some people like to eat eggs and bacon on toast. It really, really depends on the kind of person you are and what you will feel will be most comfortable. But mix it up, carbohydrates, protein, and a little bit of fat, and, um, and just make sure that you don't overeat, especially if it's uh, two hours before. Try and keep the meal to a, to a nice portion. Um, as far as race fueling goes, like I mentioned earlier, it really depends on your pace and time. Elite athletes or any other time under 90 minutes, they'll be fueled predominantly uh, uh, by glycogen, so fast-releasing carbohydrates is what's required. In that case, you're looking at either liquid feed, so uh, whatever carbohydrate drinks are along route would be sufficient enough for them, perfect, um, or even a gel here or there would be perfect, um, and even some caffeine would be perfect. So just to touch on caffeine, caffeine will work for you far better if you are caffeine intolerant. In other words, you do not have a lot of caffeine. Then caffeine has a huge benefit. For an endurance event which is very long, um, caffeine has the ability to free up a large amount of free fatty acids. In a short event, like a half marathon, it's not going to play as critical role, but it will wake the brain up, that's for sure. So taking caffeine in a, in a short distance event um, will definitely help with the brain wake up and it will actually just give you a little bit more of a, of a sense of euphoria. And we know that the mind plays a very critical role when it comes to performance. And if caffeine can help with the mind, it will definitely help with performance. And I deal with athletes all the time. Some are caffeine tolerant, so they drink a lot of coffee. And if I give them 60 or 120 milligrams of caffeine, they look at me and they go, it doesn't do anything. But give it to an athlete that, um, that uh, is caffeine intolerant and it makes a big difference. One of our sponsored athletes is James Kanema, who he actually won challenge, he won challenge Rob a couple of years ago in under eight hours, an iron distance race. And um, I had James at a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago at Ironman South Africa. And it was very interesting. He actually told the audience, I only drink caffeine on 12 days of the year. In other words, he only races 12 days of the year. The rest of the year, he doesn't touch caffeine at all. And the reason being is that he wants to experience the big benefit that caffeine has. If you do like your coffee, like I do, I definitely love my coffee, but I'm, I restrict myself to about six or seven cups a week at the most, which is not a lot at all, but I, I like a cup a day. Um, best is to try and reduce your caffeine intake three weeks before, reduce it more two weeks before, seven to ten days out of the event, I would cut the caffeine completely. You cannot cut caffeine sudden. If you're a big coffee drinker or you're taking a lot of caffeine, you just can't cut it suddenly in the week or 10 days before because then you're going to land up probably with uh, caffeine headaches and, and you're, going to, you're actually going to feel like you, you're craving it. It's going to make you feel miserable and you don't want to arrive the event, at the event feeling terrible like that. So start the process of depleting the caffeine. If it's an, a very important event to you, you can start the process of depleting caffeine quite a, a few weeks before, reducing it slowly, cutting it out and then obviously reintroducing it uh, the morning of the race. The best time to take it is actually to take very strong coffee uh, or espresso or maybe a caffeine shot uh, with your pre-race meal. So at least, uh, I would say at least uh, caffeine should be in your system at least 60 to 90 minutes before an event because that way it gets completely put into the, into the system and metabolized perfectly for use. And then obviously during an event, some athletes take it only towards the end when they want to wake up and there are some athletes that take a certain amount of caffeine per an hour during an event. So it really depends on, on, on your need. If you're running at a controlled pace um, and food solids are an option, then start off uh, with a stability feed and rather use faster releasing carbohydrates towards the finish when needed. So again, don't spike your blood sugar if you're going to go at a controlled pace. Use stability carbohydrates. Um, there's no need to spike the blood sugar and um, you can spike it towards the end when, when it's more required and you need that sort of wake up. So again, the main considerations you need to have in mind are pace and time, liquid or solid feed or both a combination of the two, um, and the caffeine option. And those are really the three, um, especially in a half marathon, that you would need to, to worry about. So that's, that's the presentation. I mean, uh, we'll take questions. Um, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to ask. Mikkel, I, I don't know if there are any questions. Actually, we have one question that I've been sparing for you, Mark, because it's related to magnesium. 
and uh, the fact that there are different kinds of magnesium and which kind of magnesium recommended in for, for, for cramps and for recovery specifically? Okay, so the interesting thing is magnesium actually is quite a it's quite an interesting topic because um, in actual fact lately I've actually been writing quite a few articles on magnesium um, for some publications. So the, the, there's a few things to consider when it comes to magnesium selection. The first is the type of magnesium that's being utilized um, and the best magnesiums to use are, are, are probably the ones that are more easily absorbed and they've got a decent bioavailability. So something like a magnesium chloride would be an option. Magnesium oxide is probably the most powerful magnesium on the market, but the problem is is that it, it, it can be destroyed quite rapidly by your digestive acids. So if it's buffered, um, we use a we use a buffer with we use a magnesium oxide and, and chloride combination and we actually buffer it with a with a special carnitine bonded paste which actually prevents it from breaking down in the upper bowels and only in the lower bowels. So so in that way, it's a, it's a nice way of, of looking at magnesium. So bioavailability is quite critical. The other thing is, is, is like I mentioned now, we, we, we bond our magnesium. How is the magnesium processed? How is it going to be released into your system? And the one thing is magnesium is so sensitive to digestive acid that taking a magnesium tablet that's going to break down in the upper bowels, and a lot of people like these fizzy drinks where they put like an effervescent magnesium tablet and they drink it, I can promise you now that you're lucky if the absorption rate of an effervescent is maybe 10 or 15 percent. It's very, very low. And so the problem is, is you're not getting enough magnesium in and you'd probably need to take about maybe 10 of those a day. The third thing to look at with magnesium is the elemental magnesium. So sometimes somebody will come to you and say, oh, I've got 500 milligrams of magnesium, but that means nothing because the elemental magnesium is actually what counts. That's what's going to be pulled into the body. So elemental magnesium um, is generally stated, uh, if you're not sure what the elemental magnesium is, you can always go and have a look if it's uh, magnesium chloride, magnesium oxide, or whatever the magnesium is, you can actually go and have a look and see how much elemental is per milligram and uh, you can calculate it. Um, some of the, we've got a very big magnesium company in South Africa, uh, again I won't mention names, they're probably the biggest seller, but the elemental magnesium is only about 40, 45 milligrams per a tablet. And uh, uh, if you have a look at our magnesium, we are 373 milligrams uh, per tablet, uh, elemental magnesium. So you're looking at one tablet that is eight times the strength of another tablet. And a lot of people don't understand that. They look at the price of the magnesium and they look at, um, uh, they just look at the, the value of the magnesium, but they don't understand the elemental magnesium in a product. So that's the, that's the third thing to look at. So always look at the elemental magnesium. Um, it's quite critical and always look at how it's released or, or the way it breaks down in the system. When it comes to cramping, it's a very, very popular topic that I discuss with people all the time because there's, there's, really, there's very few reasons why somebody will cramp. Um, the first reason is an undertrained muscle, in actual fact not even nutrition related. So when I say undertrained muscle, um, there's two things. You're either racing at an intensity uh, for a time period which is more than what you've done in training and your body hasn't adapted to that. So if your longest training run is 15 kilometers and you're running at a, just say, 420 pace and then you're going to run 21 kilometer at a 420 pace but you've never run that distance and it's 6 kilometers longer, possibly you might run the risk of cramping because the strain on your muscles is a lot longer. That's why I always believe do more than the distance um, and you really need to train the muscles properly. The other thing is that if somebody's training on a flat surface and uh, suddenly they go into a race which has got hills, you're going to use muscles which maybe you haven't adapted towards uh, that particular root profile. And again, you're going to stress muscles which are not being used much and you risk, the, you risk cramping. And the other kind of cramping is that you train at a pace faster than you're going to race at. And people say that nobody does that. And in actual fact, people do. For ultramarathon training, sometimes I mean, if I look at a 56K or, or even a, a Comrades Ultra, which is a, which is a 90K run, um, I like to use that as an example because sometimes you get marathon runners that can run a two and a half or two hour 45 marathon. And then they go into a race like that and they decide, I just want to run at 440 pace. Now, usually they run their marathons at about 330 pace or 340 pace. Now they're going to run at 440 pace. 
And when they run slower, they're using a completely different set of muscle fibers. So running at a slower pace and also what you're training at um, can also uh, onset cramps. So, so really, the point I'm trying to get across from a training perspective is train the way you're going to race. And you need to do a holistic approach to training. So you need to combine hill work, strength work, speed work, endurance speed work, all tempo, all that kind of stuff needs to be put into, um, uh, into an holistic approach when it comes to training. Most of the time, that is 90% 90, 90 of the reason that people cramp. But there are sometimes reasons why people cramp when it comes to nutrition. Overhydration can cause cramping. So taking in a little bit too much fluid can dilute your electrolyte levels. Uh, that can cause cramping. So again, not to overhydrate. Um, and then uh, obviously, like really, really, a deep, deep stage of dehydration can also onset cramping. But that's very rare. It really doesn't very much occur. Um, as far as uh, magnesium, well, if so, I can, I, I'm just um, a supplementary question, which is a guy who's going to run a 50 mile race in, in May. I know it's it's a little bit more than the half marathon, but uh, usually usually doing you know liquid foods. But if if it's a question of mixing liquids with solids, uh, maybe you can just add a few words on that as well. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, when it comes to um, Look, when it comes to long distance races, there's, there's generally, what I spoke about earlier was, uh, we spoke about liquid feed and we spoke about solid feed. 50 miles is a very long run. So, so the thing is, is that, um, what I would recommend, first of all, we need to look at the pace. Have you got the ability to eat food solids? If the pace is, is, is sufficient enough for you to eat food solids, well then that's great. Um, then you need to look at the kind of food solids you want to take in. And what I would recommend is what's called the drip feed. So in other words, you don't eat a whole banana or a whole potato or a whole packet of chews or whatever it is. You actually split the feed, and every 20 to 25 or 30 minutes, you would take something in, in the form of a carbohydrate. You would take something in, whether it's a food bar or a part of a food bar. You would, you would, I mean, I usually cut them up they're quite small, and you would try and feed more frequently so that it's less stress on the digestive system when you are consuming food solids. And then I always recommend drink to thirst only. So when you're drinking, drink to thirst. And it's better to take in a product that has got a carbohydrate base in the solution because water on its own has got an absorption rate, which is, which is a lot lower than uh, water with a carbohydrate or mineral in. The amount of uh, water that can be absorbed into the system, there's a certain rate. Let's say, let's say your body is capable of absorbing 200 milliliters per 20 minutes of water um, over an hour period. Over, if you add some, some, some carbs to that and maybe some potassium and sodium, the absorption rate might increase to 250 to 280 milliliters per 20 minutes. So you've got the ability to take in more fluid when you add a mineral and a carbohydrate. In. And it's really what I, I suggest to people is, um, is to basically re use the fluid for thirst. When you're thirsty, drink the fluid, listen to your body, and in between take in the food solids. As the race is going on, though, and you're getting less and less, uh, you, let, you, you don't want to take in uh, any more food solids because you're tired of it. And generally, that can happen in a, in, a, in a distance of 50 miles. That will definitely happen probably after 50 kilometers or 60 kilometers. You just don't want to eat anymore. Um, then I would look at probably taking in some, uh, some gels along with the fluid and, uh, and, and probably some, I mean, some of our athletes actually use protein shakes. Um, over that distance. So they're taking a protein shake over that distance and they rotate protein shake with the, with, with the carbohydrate feed in order to get some liquid in. So I don't know if that answers the question, but, um, but, uh, but that's one way of combining the two together. I wonder if there's any further questions. We've got lots of questions coming in and uh, we're trying to, um, to respond to all of them, but if, if there is something that we haven't responded to, please just yeah, please just um, fill in. You're so welcome. Because now it seems that we have just crossed the one hour timeline, so we won't take up all your evening, but I hope you had a, a very good evening. But please, if there's any final questions. Or maybe a final position from you, Mark. Yeah, so... Look, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, Mikkel's got my email address, um, and he's obviously available. If you've got any specific nutrition requirements and you're doing a specific event, um, 
we're very good at helping any customers or athletes that uh, have got that need the tailor made requirement or or help with their training and, and racing nutrition. Um, our focus isn't always on supplementation. I'm very much a fan of looking at natural always uh, completely first, looking at the natural diet and seeing how to support training and racing because that is the foundation. Supplements can play up to a 3% role um, during a race, um, but the foundation is actually your natural food and, and that's the most critical part. So um, I'm always available. Um, uh, we're actually busy developing a nice mobile application um, for Android and iOS which uh, which will actually enable um, uh, anybody to actually plug in how many carbohydrates they want per an hour, uh, if they want a protein feed, and uh, if they want uh, um, if they want food, solids, or liquids, or both. And we actually it will generate different types of, of fueling strategies. Um, we're hoping that will be launched uh, in the next I don't know six to eight weeks. We're busy working on it at the moment with some developers and. Uh, it's just something that we think will be quite beneficial, so, so I think uh, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, but again, thank you very much for attending tonight. If, the, if, if, the, if there's any way that uh, if there's any way we can be of assistance to you, then uh, then don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we are available for any help at any time. Yeah, I can just round off in Danish just to make it easy for all of us, besides you, Mark, of course. But thank you very much for your time, Mark. Um, yeah. Men til alle, alle resten af jer, der har hængt på, og det har heldigvis de fleste af jer, det er en fornøjelse at se, at der faktisk er mange, der interesserer sig for det samme, som vi gør, nemlig god ernæring under ja, de her tilfælde løb. Uh, vi er til stede ude på Expoen ude ved BT Halvmarathon, ude på Lyngby Torg fra torsdag, eller er det faktisk allerede onsdag i næste uge, og frem til søndag, hvor vi også er tilgængelige ude på selve løbsdagen til BT Halvmarathon, så der er jo også alt muligt andet til at stikke hurtigt forbi, og sludre med os, eller smage på nogle af de produkter, som vi har med at gøre. Men ellers så vil vi bare sige rigtig mange tak for i aften. Og ja, fortsat fantastisk aften, og jeg håber, vi høres ved. Vi kommer til at lave flere lignende webinars med forskellige temaer, og vi kommer som sagt til at rundsende den her præsentation i sådan en optaget version på vores YouTube-kanal. Og det kan være, at vi også lige sørger for at vedlægge nogle af de ting, som Mark har talt om, blandt andet sådan en Marathon Fuel Guide, vi har lavet, altså udmærket også kan bruges til halvmarathon, øh, sådan så at der er lidt inspiration. Men tak herfra, og have en fantastisk god aften. That was it for now, Mark. I'm going to end the, I'm going to end the session now, and thank you very much for attending, and um, yeah, I'll be in Denmark in June, so maybe I'll be meeting some of you when I'm there again. Uh, thank you very much, have a good evening.